Hello, this is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk to you about Cantelube's Chant d'Auvergne, the songs of the Auvergne. Remember those? Everybody takes them for granted. Nobody really particularly cares about them. Nobody cares about Joseph Cantelube, the composer. Cantelube, cantaloupe, whatever you want to call him. Look, this is great stuff. They are gorgeous settings. I mean, they had their 15 minutes of fame, and we'll get to that when Kiri Tekanawa sang Bailero, you know, like everywhere, like on airplanes and in supermarkets and all that stuff. But, you know, this is a wonderful, wonderful series of folk song settings that are cloaked in the most sensual, yummy, luscious orchestral coloration. And the crazy thing is that Cantelube actually wrote a lot more music that no one plays and no one cares about. And we're going to talk about at least one of those works as well. Let me just tell you something about them and what they are, because I really propose to take them seriously as, as superb little masterpieces, because that's what they are. I have here the scores. They're published by Hoegel. Hoegel et C. And uh, in in three sort of mini volumes here, but there are five, five actual books of songs, a series of songs. And because of that, and because of the way they're recorded, which is really kind of irritating, they get all mixed up and jumbled, and no one really knows how many there are. There are actually 27 numbers amongst the base, the different books. And so, you know, but, but they can be broken up in different ways because they're like little interludes and there are groups of two or three little songs in one set. And so, you know, you can, you can, if you track them all separately, you can get into the thirties pretty easily. But the fact of the matter is there are 27 separate numbers, the way Cantaloupe wrote them in five books. All right. And I would like to take a moment and discuss with you just how they're scored and what's in each set because you know they're so beautiful and no one pays any attention we all just assume it's ah it's pretty it's nice but you really should get a sense you know well sometimes i've often said just looking at the orchestration list gives you a very very good sense of the kind of craft that goes into the making of these exquisite little settings that, you know, people just sing and we hear and we go, ah, oh, it's the cantaloupe, you know, it's so pretty. Well, yes, it is. So let's take a look. Now, happily, volume one of these scores lists all of them in the series. So, you know, just so you know, let's, let's, let's get, get this straight. The first series only has three numbers in it, one of which is Bailero. Ooh, Bailero. You know, that's the one. And the second series has five numbers. And then the third series has five. And the fourth series has six. And the last series has eight. So if you add all that up, that's like for the first two, you get eight and you get 11. For the next, that's 19 plus eight. 27. That's the number of songs that's in the songs of the Auvergne. But you'll never notice that for most of the recordings. So we'll, we'll see who sort of does it the way Kentaloupe actually wrote it. A couple of them do. Anyway, let's look at, let's look at the orchestration now. The first series is scored for three flutes, one oboe, two clarinets, two bassoons, two horns, one trumpet, two timpani, one tambour, which is a you know sort of a tenor drum type thing, a piano, and a tambourine or tambour de basque, which is a tambourine. Now, one of the things that makes this series so lovely is that piano instead of a harp. The harp comes later, but in a song like Bailero which is so sensual and so beautiful. Listen to how marvelous it sounds because instead of a harp, you have the harder sound of the piano, giving the whole piece a slight amount of sort of edge and character that it just wouldn't have otherwise. If you had a harp, it would sound so tacky and, and over sentimental, but the piano changes all that. Here, listen.
See what I mean? I, it, it really is a quite an exquisite setting, and it's 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 scored with such care. Now, the second series has two flutes, one oboe, two clarinets, two bassoons, two horns, one trumpet, one timpani, and or timpano if you want to call it that, and a tambourine. The third series has two flutes, one oboe, two clarinets, two bassoons, one horn, one trumpet, one timpano, piano, cymbals, and bass drum. The fourth series has two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons, two horns, two trumpets, two timpani, one suspended cymbal, the piano, and a bass drum. And the fifth series, which is the largest of them actually, has two flutes, one oboe, one clarinet, one bassoon, one horn, one trumpet, one timpano, celesta, vibraphone, harp, cymbals, grelots. Grelots are sleigh bells. And of course, strings, you know, for all of these. It's, it's a remarkable, remarkable uh, setting. It just is. It's beautiful. And let's spend some time now talking about recordings, of which there are many. And, you know, it's almost impossible to decide which the best are, because there really aren't any bad ones. I don't think I've ever seen a recording, a review, or a mention of anyone who says, oh, so-and-so, she blew the songs of the Auvergne. Nobody blows the songs of the Auvergne. They, they, they sing themselves in some respects. They're not technically difficult. If you have a beautiful voice and you sing them nicely, they will sound beautiful. But there are some performances that bring out different characters in the music because on the one hand, they are folk songs, but on the other hand, they are very stylized and refined settings of folk songs. So you can emphasize the, the artsy element or you can emphasize the more rustic element. And that's sort of, you know, the, the, the balance that singers tend to strike or, or, or lean one way or the other, yes? So, you know, let's talk about some recordings. One of the ways we all got to know these was from Anna Mafo and Leopold Stokowski. Remember this series? This was, this was a, a single disc, not very long playing time. It was on RCA. It was reissued a million times. You only get, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. Seven of the songs of the Auvergne, plus the Bachianas Brasileiras, number five, and Rachmaninoff's vocalese. That was it. it was, it's like a 35 minute long disc. But oh my, did they sell billions of those things. And when I was in college, it was getting some airplay. It was popping back to life again. And you began to see it showing up and people were asking for it. And when it came out on CD, it sold a ton all over again. It's a beautiful, beautiful disc. And you know, for Animafo fans, of which there were a few back in the day, it was one of her best recital discs. And of course, it was for Stokowski fans, too, because you just knew that the textures were going to be like the acme of, 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 of sensuous timbre, and they are. Also, one of the reasons, things that was nice about that album was that you got the complete Bajianas Brasileiras. You know, no one hears the second part. Everyone hears the first part. You know, it's the part that was, you know, just the yummy humming slow part. But there's a dance, a second movement that sort of goes like, yeah, you know, it actually kind of sounds like that. It's very fast and very bouncy. Anyway, you'll hear that in Villa Lobos, you know, collections. Next, Songs of the Auvergne. There, and one of the, piece, the, the recordings that was very interesting because it introduced us to some more of uh, Cantalube was this one. This is Frederica von Stade with Antonio de Almeida and the Royal Philharmonic. Now, Almeida, who was a friend of mine, was a, a brilliant, brilliant connoisseur of unusual repertoire. And he dug up Cantalube's triptych. The triptych is an amazing piece. It's a, a, a triptych, three songs for mezzo and orchestra based on somewhat tacky poetry. Um, the <laughs> titles of them are Offering to Summer, uh, Moonlight or Lunaire, the moon, and then finally the hymn in 
Dans l'aurore, the hymn in in the the dawn, basically, right? It's it's really it's really a a uh, gorgeous piece, and I'm going to play you a bit of it. Uh, not this recording because I don't have the permission. It's going to be Veronique Jean on Naxos, which is fantastic, and you know, I mean, that final that final hymn in the aurora and dans l'aurore and the dawn whatever the heck it is you know it is is wonderful because it it sort of does it's kind of like Schoenberg's girl leader rearranged for one singer <laughs> you know the end of girl leader when you've got 7000 screaming people shrieking about sun the sun coming up but this does the same thing and it gets it done in 8 minutes and it sounds even better trust me here listen to this Makes you want to hear a little bit more of of Contelube, doesn't it? But unfortunately, we very seldom do. But at least this piece has been recorded a couple times. Now, the von Stadter recordings, there were two of them, you know, because they did, you know, all of the songs of the Auvergne in different order, but they did them all. And the thing that really annoyed me about this is that the performances are wonderful, the recording was wonderful, but Sony promptly messed it up because they, instead of having, you know, just leaving it as a two disc set with the triptych, they then issued a single disc which had bits from both of them all scrambled up and deleted one of them and so now you can't find it anymore and it's just eh, major label bullshit, that's what it is. One of the classic recordings of these songs of the Auvergne in the more refined form of them was Victoria de los Angeles. Victoria de los Angeles was, of course, a glorious, glorious singer. This was another huge seller, one of her, her great, great recordings with the Lamoureux Orchestra conducted by Jean-Pierre Jacquillat. And it's beautiful. It's definitely one of the great recordings of the century. It says so right on the record. That's how we know. Then, of course, we got the Dame. There is nothing like a Dame, right? Dame Kiri de Kanawa. There she is with Jeffrey Tate and the English Chamber Orchestra. She also does Bachianas Brasileiras number five at the end of this. Now, this was because it was the major label and it was universal and it was de Kanawa at the height of her fame. This was the disc that sold the songs of the Auvergne to billions and billions and billions of people who had never heard of them before, particularly by Lero, which, like I said, they were playing everywhere. I mean, everywhere. They played it at the Olympics. They played it everywhere. It sold a trillion copies. This set, though, was criticized when it came out because it was considered by some to be too refined, you know, too too you know, beautiful and stylized and creamy gorgeous. I mean, you can't sing this stuff too gorgeously, really. I mean, when you get right down to it, it's a beautiful, beautiful disc. It's still around. It's easy to find. It's, it's, it's wonderful. What's not to love? Then we got Kent Nagano and Dawn Upshaw on two Erato discs. Dawn Upshaw was one of the great, great song singers 
of the last third, let's say, of the 20th century. You get all the songs of the Auvergne and you get another fantastic coupling, a smart coupling. And you could always count on Dawn Upshaw to do smart recitals and smart couplings. Remember her wonderful non-such recitals and things like that. They were great. She's terrific. It's Maurice Emmanuel. Remember him? I, 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 I did a video about his six sonatinas for piano. And these are his Chanson Bourguignon du Pays du Bone, Burgundian songs from the Bone area for voice and orchestra. Bone, 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 B-A-U-N-E, not B-O-N-E, bone. You know what I mean, right? A wonderful, wonderful set. Go find it if you can. <laughs> then we have the performances from which the musical excerpts of this talk are drawn. The Naxos recordings with Véronique Jean and the Orchestre Nationale de Lille, conducted on the one hand by Serge Baudot, and on the other hand, by Jean-Claude Casadesu. Excellent, excellent, excellent performances, beautifully recorded. I, this is actually Orchestre National de Lille Région Nord Pas de Calais. Whatever that means. I mean, I know what it means. I just don't care what it means. Why can't you just call it the Lille Philharmonic and be done with it, right? I mean, these long names that no one can remember. And these are beautiful. Veronique Jean is, of course, a fantastic singer. And the performances are lovely. And they're readily available, thank God, on two beautifully recorded CDs. And it's also nice to see Serge Baudo, a wonderful conductor, you know, making a, an appearance, a welcome appearance after a long time in the discographic wilderness. However, if you got to pick one, and you got to pick one, one song of the Auvergne, one that's unlike any other, that gives the best, captures the most wonderful combination of art and rusticity and, and, and folk-like appeal. It's Natanya Davroth on Vanguard. Now, I, this has been like, you know, here's, here's the old, the old cover here. Look at that. You should just have a look at it. She was such a wonderful singer. She graces the the Abravanel Mahler four with like the best ever account of the finale. She had a very, a very almost boyish timbre to her voice. She sings this music with complete what they call artlessness, total, total naturalness from from start to finish. It's just beautiful. The record, the orchestra is a pickup orchestra. It's conducted by Pierre de la Roche. I mean, who cares? They sound fine. Again, a little bit of edge to the timbre because it's so sensual and refined anyway. Doesn't hurt. It just adds additional variety and character to the performances. And if you're looking for just one, Songs of the Auvergne, then the one to get is Natanya Davroth on Vanguard. If you can still find it, it's probably still around. I mean, this was this is just one of those, you know, connoisseurs of the songs of the Auvergne know this recording. And they for years they've been saying, okay, yeah, Takana was great, Veronique Jean is great, Victoria de Los Angeles is great, they're all great singers. I mean, Dawn Upshaw was a great singer, <laughs> you know, Federico von Stade was a great singer. But for this work, Natanya Davroth owns it. It's that simple, folks. So keep on listening to the Songs of the Auvergne and anything else by Cantaloupe that may come your way. He's definitely worth further investigation. Thank you and enjoy. <laughs>